a heat attack right now. There you Girl. go. You and me both. There we go. It's recording. Now we're recording. <laughs> Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us for another session of our Investing in God Equals Investing in You series. Today's topic that we're going to talk about is hypertension, the silent killer. It is one of the two most deadliest uh, conditions in our community. We have with us today a expert in the area, um, one of our one of our very own, Dietra Debus Moore. Moore, she is with us, and she's going to share some definite information that will help us and help our loved ones, help our community overall um, to avoid the potential of hypertension um, so we can see the warning signs of it and what we can do about preventing it or controlling it if we have it. She is a wealth of knowledge. Um, she has been in the industry for over almost 25 years. She's a um, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy nurse. Um, practitioner. Uh, so she deals with the heart and its conditions daily. Um, so I think she will definitely impart some knowledge for us. So I hope you are all ready. Dee, I'd like to turn it over to you if you would like to say a little bit more about your history. Oh, nah, I'm pretty low key. <laughs> But <laughs> my background is cardiothoracic surgery mainly, but I have been in cardiology for the past seven years. So I've been doing this, now you may be kind of old, I've been doing this for a little bit of time now, obviously. But I've been a nurse for about 30 years. And today we're going to talk about high blood pressure. A lot of times people are not aware that they have it because uh, sometimes you're not always symptomatic and it is particularly prevalent in our people. And with our people, a lot of people have end organ damage, meaning kidney disease, strokes, eye issues, so the heart, so the heart failure. So this is something that we need to be mindful of in our people. And I'm going to keep this very casual, low key. If you want to ask me a question, ask away throughout the presentation. Don't feel the need to ask me at the end. A lot of give and take. Okay. Yes. All right. Perfect. So. I'm not the most computer savvy. Here we go. So what is hypertension? The rules of hypertension have changed. Now, they found out through research that when your blood pressure is, then I'm talking about the top number, the systolic number, when it's over 150, that's when the risks of- If you're not speaking, can you please go on mute? The risks of- complications from high blood pressure start to increase once your blood pressure goes top number goes above 115, which is why the new rules are ideal blood pressure, top number, which is the systolic pressure, should be no higher than 120. The bottom number, which is called the diastolic pressure, should be 80 or less, which is kind of new because before... Yeah. Is, is that realistic? <laughs> <laughs> For us folks, no. <laughs> but also too you got to think about it pharmaceutical companies have to make money somehow right they got to make those that money. so 120 over 80 or less is the new ideal goal if your blood pressure your top number above 120 they're calling that uh, elevated blood pressure and if your blood pressure is in the 130s that's now called stage one hypertension and if it's uh, at least 140 and above is called now, if your blood pressure is talking about the top number, like 140 for like a 20 year span, what can happen to the art? Again, if you're not speaking, please put yourself on mute. Thank you. Yeah, that works. So if the if your blood pressure top number is 140 for 20 plus years, what can happen to your arteries in your body? They get weak and dilated because that constant pounding from high elevated pressure can cause your blood vessels to dilate, especially the arteries. So what I'm talking about here is your aorta, which is the largest artery in your body. It's called aortic dissection. Anyone ever heard of that aortic dissection? So that's a weakness of the aorta. It could perforate, and if it perforates, 
then you're going to unfortunately have a demise. You're going to bleed out. And that's not something that you want to happen. You would have to then have some type of surgical prevention or some type of percutaneous intervention called the stent. Because now, you know, we're getting so savvy and technologically, you can do percutaneous things. And percutaneous meaning you can go to the cath lab and they can put a catheter in and they can put a stent. They can stent almost anything at this point in time. So they can either stent the weakness of the aorta. So, which is why most primary care physicians are very in tuned to blood pressure. The problem is in African-Americans and our people is kind of difficult to get our blood pressure 120 and below. That's the issue. And we're gonna talk about some measures about how we can work on that, but that's later on in the presentation. First, I wanna make sure that you know how to measure your blood pressure. So what's a good idea to do is to get into the habit of going to the pharmacy and getting a blood pressure cuff and measuring your blood pressure, especially if you have a history of heart uh, disease or high blood pressure in your family. I like to use one of these type of machines that you hit the button. I'm lazy. I could take my own blood pressure, but I like one of these machines. You put the cuff on, you hit the button, you set it, forget it, right? Perfect. Might I add, do not exercise, do not have caffeine. And if you're a smoker, do not smoke prior to taking your blood pressure. If you got to pee, empty your bladder first because ain't nothing worse than having to pee and trying to take your blood pressure and you're wiggling in the chair. <laughs> That's going to cause your blood pressure to go up. <laughs> pee first. <laughs> and make sure you have the cuff in the proper position. Always should be in the upper arm. We see this tube here. This tube should be on the front. If you want me to, to show you how to do it, you place the cuff on your arm like so. Can everybody see okay? Mm -hmm. Perfect. You put it on your upper arm and you make sure that this tube is in the front. Let me, let me do it right here. And, and then you relax. Put your arm down level to the desk or the armchair. Take some deep breaths. It's always a good idea to wait five to 10 minutes. Once you sit your behind down in your chair, wait five to 10 minutes for you to get settled because exercise and movement causes your blood pressure to go up. That's not your true resting blood pressure because we're trying to see what your blood pressure is at rest. Rest your arm and then you hit the button and you take your blood pressure. So it's a good idea to measure your blood pressure twice a day if possible. I know a lot of times when you're trying to get dressed and get up and get ready for work, you don't leave yourself a lot of time for extra because, you know, the bed is just so good in the morning and you wait till the last minute to get up. But it's always a good idea to measure your blood pressure in the morning and in the evening. That makes sense. And please, when you're taking your blood pressure, do not move your arm. Also, too, what's also important for a proper blood pressure measurement is cuff size. As you can see, this cuff is pretty decent for me. But if you're a large person, you're going to need to get the big girl, a big boy blood pressure cuff. And unfortunately, all blood pressure machines come in the regular size. The large cuff is extra. If you happen to be particularly large, the large cuff may not be uh, sizable enough for you. And so you might have to get the thigh cuff. And I'm talking those who are like 400, 500 pounds, they would need to purchase a thigh cuff. And thigh cuffs are ones that are meant for normal people's thighs, but that would be placed on their arm, if that would make sense. So cuff size is important. If you have the wrong cuff size, it's going to artificially elevate your blood pressure and it's not going to be accurate. And you're going to be placed on things that you have no business taking. And that could be a problem. All right. So I would also then like to move on to, uh-oh, hold on a second. My slides are out of order. Give me a second there because what I have and what I have are different things. All right, here we go. Perfect. Here we go. Risk factors. That's where I want to be. Risk factors for high blood pressure. Uh-oh. There we are. There are a lot of things that could be done to prevent high blood pressure. Weight. Inactivity. Now, we're in the midst of COVID. I don't know about y'all, but I know I gained COVID weight. I know if you were here prior to us starting this little tidbit, I shared that I have recently lost 30 pounds. And the reason why I recently lost 30 pounds was because I gained 30 pounds. <laughs> With COVID, it was nothing to do. You could go to the gym. You couldn't really be active. So I know a lot of people who've gained weight. 
from inactivity. And as a result, my blood pressure did go up. Then also I developed diabetes at the same time. So for me, losing weight was something I had no choice to do because life is just too precious for me. So one of the things that you could do to lower your blood pressure is to keep your weight down. Now, I know when you go to the primary care doctor, they talk about ideal body weight or BMI, body mass index. BMI is not for African-Americans. BMI was created, it was based on uh, Caucasian men, not even Caucasian women. So BMI does not relate to African-Americans. I don't want you to go to the primary care and try to get your weight down to base what they feel is BMI because it, you'll be too thin. African-Americans are heavy boned or large bone. You need to get down to a weight that feels comfortable for you. If your clothes fit well, you know how we women are. I can't speak about the men. You know, we always want to be a size six or size eight. If you can get to a perfect size eight or even a perfect size 10, we're happy. If that's your happy weight, by all means, go for it. Also to be active. And by being active, I don't mean you need to do the Jane Fonda workout or you need to be sweating and doing the hardcore gym exercise. What I'm talking about here, go for a walk. And when I mean go for a walk, not around the corner, not around the block. I'm talking a good two plus miles per day. You know, three to five miles is awesome. It's starting to get warm out. There's, there's be no excuse. The days are getting longer after you get home from work or if you're, not, if you're working from home, stop working at a reasonable time. I know with a lot of people working from home, they lose track of time. And a lot of times before they know it, it's getting dark and they put in 12, you know, 10, 11, 12 hour days. Where'd the time go? Yes. You got to set an alarm on your phone. Listen, employers know that this COVID thing had a little silver lining. People are working from home and they actually are ending up working longer and they're being a whole lot productive and the demands have gone up higher. But the downside of that is you're sitting for longer periods of time and your, your, your rear end is spreading. You got to get up and walk around every hour <laughs> or every two hours, set the alarm on your cell phone at a reasonable time so that you know, oh, the day is done because you need to get up, make yourself something to eat, start walking. Another modifiable risk is your diet. That's another problem with working from home. You know, when you're at work, you smell the cafeteria, you bring your food in, you, you smell people getting ready for lunch and you realize, oh, it's time to, for lunch. You'll go to the cafeteria perhaps and get a meal. Or, you know, you prepared yourself some leftovers and that's your meal for the day. Well, working from home, a lot of times you either forget to eat or you get something quick because you're too busy working and you're getting something out of a box. Anything that's prepared from a box generally is high in salt. And with salt comes um, water. And that, next thing you know, you have water retention and you're swollen. Or you get stressed out because you're working so much or COVID's got you so down because the news is, is full of such great news, you're having wine to calm your nerves, right? I mean, during the election, I know I was hitting that bottle of wine, all that Trump stuff and all that craziness back in November. I was, I know I'd increase my alcohol consumption to calm my nerves. So alcohol too is not good because it causes constriction and increases your blood pressure. So alcohol is not, too much alcohol is not a good thing. Every now and again, a little tip is a little nip is okay. <laughs> Unfortunately, there are some unmodifiable risk factors such as family history. If one or two parents have high blood pressure, more than likely somebody in terms of the children are going to have high blood pressure. It's just a matter of when. You can run, but you can't hide from your genes, unfortunately. And, and genetics accounts for about 30% of people who have high blood pressure. Okay. Also to age. As you get older your blood pressure starts to go up. And that's because you've been blessed with older age. The good Lord has blessed you. And with that, as we age, our, our arteries get, you know, kind of stiff. It's like a rubber band, you know? A rubber band, a fresh rubber band is very malleable. You can stretch it to in any old kind of way. And then after a while, as the rubber band gets old, it gets harder and harder to stretch. It gets kind of stiff. Same thing with aging and the pressure increases. And unfortunately, race plays the role African-Americans are more prone to than our other races, unfortunately. And in our people, as I said before, we get greater complications from that as a result. Anybody have any questions on that? Oh, well, Connie, I can't hear you. You're muted. 
There is a question that came up around when you were talking about taking your blood pressure. Is ah. it important to do it at the same time every day? Ideally, it's imp- it, it would be nice to do it at the same time every day. If I have a patient who has blood pressure that's uncontrolled, sometimes I'll ask them to do it multiple times a day at different times. They, when you first wake up, your blood pressure is high. It's the fight or flight response that gets you up in the morning. So your blood pressure is sky high when you first wake up, hence why there are a lot of heart attacks that occur first thing in the morning. Mm. So I suggest to patients not to take their blood pressure when they first wake up, but to wait, get themselves together, settled and situated either after their breakfast or if you're one of those who's quick eating breakfast and scooting out the door before breakfast after you get dressed and to take your blood pressure around that time and also too it's also a good idea and I meant to mention this as well to place your blood pressure readings in a log you got to record them in a log or in your little notebook and you take that notebook with you when you go to your primary care doc because those are the blood pressures that you have at home there are some people when they go to a healthcare provider their blood pressures are skyrocketing. We call that white coat syndrome. You see the white coat and you, you, you panic because either we're going to stick you with blood or we're going to tell you some bad news. It's just an uncomfortable process for a lot of people, which is why it's so important. When you're at home, you're in your own home environment. You're comfortable. You're relaxed. <sighs> the blood pressure should be the closest to what it's ordinarily going to be day in and day out. Did I miss any other questions? Because I, I can't see when I'm no, sharing. You're good. That, was the, that was the one that came up. Fabulous. All right, perfect. Kind of just, but I do have one now that you've uh, you you said though about the waking up. Tip: Sometimes you wake up with a headache. Could that be a result of your high blood pressure? It can be for sure. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It can be. Then I would check it just to see what it is. Okay. Okay. So for my patients, it's a good point. Sometimes their blood pressure remains high. Those are the patients who probably need twice a day. Like if, for example, all right. I take, I have high blood pressure and I take my pills once a day, which works for me. But there are some patients who take their meds, say in the morning. And by the time, like me, I take my, actually I take my meds at night, but there are most patients take their meds in the morning, like around 10 o'clock or eight o'clock. Sometimes when they wake up, their blood pressure is high just before they take their meds. So for those particular patients, I will give them a twice a day drug, once in the morning and once at night. The nighttime dose takes care of the headache in the morning. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. I was like, I, I remember telling my doctor, hey, I, I think I, when I wake up mid-dream, I have a headache. <laughs> She's like, yeah, that has nothing to do with why you have a headache. <laughs> the dream, no. <laughs> But also too, Connie, you also got to take consideration seasonal allergies. Sometimes those headaches, especially if they're over the eye, could be from sinuses. You press in and if you press into your eye up here and the headache goes away, those are the sinuses. And I'll, you know. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. Oh my God, I'm having a hard time. I'm hitting the wrong button. (laughs) Complications from high blood pressure. If left unchecked, high blood pressure can cause kidney disease. You can be on dialysis, which is not a good look. 70% of the patients, a 70% mortality in kidney failure the first five years of being on dialysis, especially if you don't get a transplant, which is kind of scary. You can also have heart disease, either heart failure, because the heart just gets exhausted and gives out. You can have a stroke. A hemorrhagic stroke, meaning one of the vessels in your brain just, and then you get blood in the brain and blood is toxic to brain tissue. It causes the brain tissue to swell. Now the head is encased by the skull. So your brain is in, is very well protected with bone. So when the brain swells, there's no place for the pressure to go, but down. So blood in the brain is bad. It has to be controlled. It's emergency neurosurgery. They have to evacuate the blood because if you don't take care of that, what's going to happen is what's called brain herniation and the brain tissue is going to go down in the back because there's less pressure back here towards the brain stem. 
The brainstem, which is in the back of your neck back here, is what controls breathing and your heart rate. And that's one of the last things, if you have head injury, it's one of the last things to go is breathing and your heart spontaneously going. So when you herniate and you herniate to the brainstem, that's it, you, you know, which is not a good look. Also too, what can happen is stroke from clots. We call that an ischemic stroke, heart failure, and something called left ventricular hypertrophy. And that's when the left ventricle gets very muscular. Because remember, the heart is using, generating a lot of pressure, an elevated blood pressure. It gets muscular at first, which is not necessarily a good look because that muscle's got to go somewhere. And a lot of times where that muscle goes is goes inside the cavity of the ventricle. And the sole point and purpose of the ventricle is to fill and expand with blood, right? So you need a decent sized cavity so you can fill and expand with blood. If the cavity gets too small, the ventricle can't fill and expand with the blood as well, so that when it does contract, it's not putting out a lot of blood, and hence why you get heart failure. Does that make sense how I pre present that picture? Mm -hmm. Awesome. And that's how you get hypertensive cardiomyopathy. Again, not a good look at all. Okay? Any questions on that before I move on? Perfect. You're good. All right. So what can we do about this? Well, the first thing that we need to do if we get high blood pressure, and I'm talking 130s, okay. If your blood pressure gets to 140s over 90, you need an intervention. Let's start there. However, for those particular people who have blood pressure in the 130s over the high 80s, who have diabetes, known diabetes, who have some mild heart disease, your physician or advanced practice provider should be more aggressive at getting your blood pressure down, okay? So anyone with diabetes who has some mild coronary artery disease because you know they're not eating right or they have a lot of stress, diabetes, I'm gonna repeat myself, should have a lower threshold to do something about their pressure. So I'm talking 130s over 85 or 130s over 86 or 137 over 88 they should be doing major lifestyle modification ahead of time. I think you should do it anyway, but there definitely is a call to be extremely aggressive. You have to do something because if you do not do something, then medications is going to be in your immediate future. So let's talk about, with that being said, let's talk about some lifestyle modifications. One of the biggest things that can be done well, actually, before we start about lifestyle modifications, let me backtrack a little bit. Some other causes of hypertension is oral contraceptives, antidepressants, decongestants, some weight loss medication, like you see those ephedra meds, recreational drug use like cocaine, kidney disease, and if you have obstructive sleep apnea. Untreated obstructive sleep apnea is going to cause high blood pressure, and new studies show it causes ir irregular heart rate, AFib. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In fact, one of my in-laws died recently from untreated obstructive sleep apnea. She never got it treated and it caused uh, pulmonary hypertension. And she died from pulmonary hypertension from untreated, and she had AFib as well. What, uh, what exactly is that, D? Can you explain that so people understand what that is? Sure. Obstructive sleep apnea is when your airway gets occluded when you sleep. And there's a number of reasons why that can occur. It could be your tongue goes in the back of your throat and, and occludes your airway. Or if you're a little obese, the extra tissue in the back of your throat, that gets enlarged too. When you gain weight, you gain weight everywhere in your body your legs, your thighs, the back of your throat. And so the tissues occlude your airway and you snore. The biggest hallmark of obstructive sleep apnea is snoring. And sometimes you can hear people snoring down the hallway and then they stop breathing. <laughs> and it occludes all the way to the point they're like, <laughs> and then you, there's seconds where there's no sound and then there's, <sighs> right? And these people always complain how exhausted they are. They're always tired because they don't get good quality sleep because when they stop breathing, they kind of, their oxygen levels drop. Their body says, oh, your oxygen levels are low and it'll wake itself, the body will wake you up and then you take a breath in and then you go back to sleep. Mm -hmm. 
The, and the treatment for it is a CPAP or a BiPAP machine. You get that little cute little sexy mask. You attach to a machine at the bedside. You turn it on and that's how you sleep. But listen, no. people who get that, yeah, some people love it. They sleep well. And then there's other people who just are not comfortable with the no. air being forced into your face. Uh, CPAP is not as well tolerated as BiPAP. So if you're someone who's struggling with their machine and you're on CPAP, speak to your pulmonologist and have them consider something called BiPAP, which is air going in and air going out. CPAP, you just get slammed with that mm -hmm. air and a lot of people don't tolerate that. So if you don't tolerate that, try a, a, a dual way of it. It's called BiPAP. Or it shoots up, or the mask shoots up in your eyes. <laughs> air shoots up in your eyes. Well, you know, there's a, yeah, there's a new thing out, you know, called Inspire. But you have to be a certain weight for it. Mm -hmm. So what Inspire is, is they take an incision underneath your skin here to the left part of your chest, and it's a stimulator. And what the stimulator does is st they put a, an electrode towards the back of your throat where that little bit of excess tissue is, and then they what, you turn it on when you go to sleep. And then 30 minutes after you fall asleep, the transmitter will start to stimulate some electrodes to the back of your throat. And when you start to snore, it'll move that tissue with an electrical pulse. Fancy stuff. That's a little much though. <laughs> yeah, but I don't you know, know if we want anything. anything implanted in our body. <laughs> well, I get it, but it's under the skin and you won't need a BiPAP or CPAP. Okay, all right. If you don't tolerate CPAP or BiPAP, then that might be an option because untreated sleep apnea is a killer. So it's called Inspire. You know, my slides are out of order. I don't know why. So I apologize for that because I was messing with them just prior to the presentation. All right. So where was I? What can be done? We were talking about lifestyle modification. So here it is. Be mindful of what you eat. That's big. Look at this reduced sodium progresso soup. I know a lot of people like soup. I know we get made to go into spring. We're in spring now. But in the wintertime, you know, warm meals, chicken noodle soup when you when you're sick. Or sometimes you just want soup. This is supposed to be reduced sodium. Do you see how much sodium is in it? I don't know if you guys can see that. Believe it or not, this can is two servings. One serving size of this is one cup. And this is a two cup can. Who, who knew? So one cup of this soup is, what is that? 470 milligrams of sodium. If you had the whole can like I would, that is 1,020 milligrams of sodium. That is crazy. Low sodium diet means 2,000 milligrams of sodium a day. 2,000 milligrams. So this whole can right here is half of your daily allowance of sodium. That's just dinner. What happened to breakfast and lunch? So you should shoot for 500 milligrams per meal, 250 milligrams between breakfast and lunch, and another 250 milligrams between lunch and dinner. That will give you 2000 milligrams. Now, if you're not a person who snacks between meals, then you can increase the amount of sodium. You've got an extra 500 so that you can use. So you can have that can of soup. <laughs> All right, chicken stock. I don't know if anyone are cooks here, but we use chicken stock, right? Kitchen basics, nice, reasonable, cheap. Can you believe one cup of that is about 440 milligrams of sodium? We still have, and that's not including, you're going to salt the chicken, right? You're going to salt the chicken, but you don't salt your chicken? Very good. Oh, Ma'am. Good girl. My well, dad had high blood pressure. <laughs> yeah, right. You know, me too. But, you know, people salt the chicken and then you're going to put it in the chicken stock and whatever else you're going to put in there, right? Before you're done, you've got chicken that's a good 600 milligrams of sodium and we didn't even get to the vegetable mm -hmm. or the starch. Because if you're going to have potatoes, you're going to salt the, the, the water for the potatoes, right? And a little bit of salt in the vegetables. Unless you know not to add salt into your food. Shouldn't add any stock in there either unless you make it homemade because then there's no salt in there, right? Salad dressing. So, okay, we're going to be healthy. We're going to have salad. Because salad, vegetables, is healthy. 
Did you know you have to be mindful of your salad dressing too? Homemade salad dressing is the best because it's got no salt in it. So, and they tell you vinaigrette is healthier than the regular salad dressings, which can be high in fat. This is Ken's Steakhouse, Italian dressing and marinade. Two tablespoons have 460 milligrams of sodium. Two tablespoons. You know how we like to do with our salad? We like to douse it in salad dressing. So when you look at salad dressing, you have to be mindful of how much sodium is in it and what a serving size is. Isn't that nothing? And here we have beans. Now I'm not saying beans are terrible. Beans are actually very good for you. So here's Goya chickpeas. You can put them in your salad with that salad dressing. That, <laughs> I'm saying. <laughs> oh, wait a minute. <laughs> oh, I put the wrong thing on the thing. Doggone it. But a Goya um, chickpeas are 380 milligrams of sodium. Mm. Okay. And normally you have that with rice. Salted rice too. Otherwise, rice don't taste good. But that's okay. With rice and Goya, that would give you about 500 milligrams of sodium. Just don't have a salad with it on the side with the Ken Steakhouse Italian. Otherwise, you're coming closer to over about 1,000 in turn milligrams of sodium. Here we have uh, spaghetti sauce. Now, you know, if you're like me, sometimes you just tie it. And when you come home from work, you want a quick meal, you'll pick up a, a jar of spaghetti sauce and put it with your pasta real quick you know doctor it up a little bit you know make it taste good well there is 390 milligrams of sodium and a half a cup of the spaghetti sauce now i don't know about you guys but a half a cup is not a lot i mm -hmm. like to put a lot of spaghetti sauce on on my pasta so i do about a cup and so that would be 800 milligrams of sodium and I like to have a salad on the side and put that with that other salad dressing you're talking about 1200 milligrams of sodium just for dinner which is too much because remember with, with salt comes water right and then you start to swell and you get retention and your blood pressure is through the roof because how many times and when you go out to dinner anytime you go out to dinner that's already automatically a high salt meal because it tastes good. They use kosher salt and then they finish it with sea salt. So anytime you go to a restaurant, the food is double salted and high in butter. But that's what makes it so yummy. But don't be surprised when you go out to dinner you're, and the, it's good going down, but the next day your blood pressure is going to be high. Your fingers might be a little swollen or your ankles normal. Hence why it's not the best idea to go out to dinner. <laughs> hate to say it. Now, Skippy Natural Cream. This is good stuff. Skippy Natural Peanut Butter is only 150 milligrams for two tablespoons. I got to give you one that's good, you know. Can't have it all bad. And peanut butter is good for you. High in protein. Another thing that you need to do, exercise. Get out there, walk around. Run if you want to. A good three to five miles. Walk three to five miles at least three to four times a week, at least. The more you do it, the better, you know. And lifting weights is also good too, helps to build muscle. And I can't extol, extol to you how important it is to exercise. I'm gonna hit the wrong button. <clears throat> and weight loss, lose weight. It leads to significant drop in blood pressure. So for every 2.2 pounds lost, I can't see how many it is, but I think it's two to four millimeters of mercury. That's the measurement for uh, blood pressure. So walk, you see this lovely African-American sister here. She's losing weight. The more weight you lose, the lower your blood pressure comes to a certain level. And it's also good for you in terms of heart healthiness and heart disease and alcohol. A little nip every now and again is okay. But if you're somebody who drinks every day, that's an issue. Women should drink no more than one alcoholic drink a day. Men, no more than two. And I say you shouldn't drink every day to start with. Every now and again is okay. 
because alcohol causes elevated blood pressure. And there's empty calories, causes weight gain as well. So it's never a good idea to drink daily. And de-stress, self-care. I can't stress that enough. We got to stop running around. I know we in the Northeast, it's almost like a rat race every day, but it's not good for you. Stress causes anxiety, which causes elevated blood pressure. So you need to stop running, take some time for yourself, sit outside and enjoy that warm weather, do some meditation, yoga, play with your granddaughter, grandbaby, or your child's color, do some Play-Doh, right? If you have an animal, they're very good for you. Animals are great pet therapy, if you have. They are also a lot of work, but they're great pet therapy. And it's always good to try to socialize with your friends outside six feet away. <laughs> I know COVID's still around and we're all COVID weary. I'm COVID weary myself, but it is good to socially interact, but from six feet. You don't need to get COVID because, you know, COVID's killing a lot of our people. Now, if all that, you do all that self-care, you exercise, you lose weight, you change your diet, but you're still not at 120 or 80, not even close, it may be time to start medication. Okay? Now, I already talked about this. I'm ahead of myself that... If you have these conditions, you need to make sure you start medication if you have not been able to lower your blood pressure. And in African-Americans, calcium channel blockers, something called diltiazem or cortisem, or something called amlodipine or Norvasc are some of the medications that should be used for African-Americans because they tend to work better. Or diuretic, like hydrochlorothiazide or chlorothalidone, African-American people, we do better with diuretics and something called the calcium channel blocker. Uh, Caucasians, they use something called an angiotensin receptor or angiotensin blocker. That shouldn't be the first agents for people like us. That should be the first agents for Caucasian people. However, if you do have type 2 diabetes or if you have kidney disease, you do need to be on something called an ACE inhibitor or angiotensin blocker because it protects the kidneys. And in diabetes... Sure, shoot. All right, so someone, there's two, actually. Someone asked about, going back when you talked about the food, it says if you wash the canned beans first, does that reduce the salt intake? Yeah, that'll help to reduce some of that salt intake. Okay. But again, the salt in the canned beans is not terrible. It's not terrible. It just depends on what you're going to do with it. Okay. But yes, if you rinse that, that'll work. I'm, I, I can't see any comments, so I apologize. Okay. You got you. Now, the okay. other one that you, you, you really just started to do it, the, the question is, how will African-Americans really know what the best medication is? You know, when we deal with doctors, unless we, I guess we know our doctor well, um, you know, they could be putting us on anything. So, I mean, are there some, probably not not saying, because I don't want to put you in a position, but what would be some thoughts about certain, the, the medications that we should be taking? You're naming different types, but for us, I guess names make a difference when we go to the doctor and the doctor says, okay, um, you know, I'm going to put you on this. I'm going to put you on Lisinopril. I'm going to put you on, it, you know, is there certain things that you've seen work better for African-Americans than other? Yes, and there's literature on that, actually, like a diuretic, a calcium channel blocker. Those are the broad terms. So if they come to you and say, I want to put you on Lisinopril, Lisinopril is actually something we call an ACE inhibitor. You're going to tell them, is that a diuretic or a calcium channel blocker? Okay. You don't have to know the specific name of the drug, but those are the broad terms. Okay. And so what what between those two things is, is that we're going to be looking for? You understand what I'm saying? We're going in. We don't know nothing about it. So the doctor says, okay, uh, I'm going to put you on so-and-so. What, so what is the blocker versus the other one? What, what are they doing? What, what are those particular drugs doing 
okay. what's on our you. inside. I got you. What a diuretic does, it causes you to pee. So it, oh, no. it, <laughs> well, for us, you know what a diuretic is. The yeah. calcium channel blocker, however, I got what you're saying to me. Okay. Uh, a little physiology. Heart muscle. And when it contracts, that means calcium runs into a muscle cell. When calcium runs into the muscle cells, it starts a contraction. So a calcium channel blocker blocks the calcium from rushing into the muscle cell and reduces the contraction and that lowers the blood pressure. Is that what you're, that's what you're asking for, right? Got you. Okay. Yes, yes, yes. Calcium channels in the heart muscle. Calcium runs in, contraction. So that generally tends to work best in for African Americans because we're, we're we're highly muscular people. I mean, we built this whole country on our backs, right? So hence, it makes it uh, makes perfect sense of why it tends to work better for us. Diuretic makes you get rid of all that extra fluid. Um, I've given an example of a type of medication, but I do want to put in a little caveat here. If you have diabetes, you have heart disease. One of the meds you need to be placed on is something called an ACE inhibitor, A-C-E inhibitor, or an A-R-B called an angiotensin blocker. All you need to know is A-R-B and an ACE, A-C-E inhibitor. Those are for diabetics and those with heart disease. You're going to need to be on that as well as another high blood pressure medication. You're, not, you're going to be on more than that because those protect the kidneys. Remember in diabetes, you need to keep your blood sugars under control. You guys had that diabetes lecture already, right? All right, because if you do not keep your diabetes or your blood sugars under control, sugary blood affects your kidneys. Sugary blood affects your eyes. Sugary blood affects the nerve endings in your feet and in your hands. So to protect the kidneys, since there's a high mortality rate, remember the first five years of being on dialysis, there's like a 70% mortality. So we're very much honed into protecting those kidneys. Research has shown that an ACE inhibitor or an ARB is protective. So when you have high blood pressure and you have diabetes, those are two double whammies that are gonna really affect the kidneys which is why it's important that you're on an ACE or an ARB as well as perhaps a diuretic um, and a calcium channel blocker. Should be probably on all three because your blood pressure is going to be difficult to control. Did that help? Fabulous. Okay. But for people who don't have diabetes, they don't have heart disease, a diuretic or calcium channel blocker should be one of the first first or second agent. Any questions? Good. Perfect. And that, my loves, is it. So let's um, let's open it up to if there's any questions that people wanted to ask, uh, please feel free, ask, ask away. Um, I have a question about the diuretic. Yes. Now, um, a number of I guess, is that like a precursor potentially to other medicines when they're saying, well, you know, just to make sure we keep this under control, we're going to put you on a diuretic. You know, that means that I actually have high blood pressure. <laughs> no, no, no. Uh, you, want to tell me. Be... I'm sorry, go ahead. I said, is she telling me I have high blood pressure and just doesn't really want to tell me I truly have high blood pressure? You should not allow any healthcare provider to start any medication without an explanation. So you need to know what it is, what the potential effects are. Diuretics should not be prescribed lightly because it can cause electrolyte imbalances. And you should have your electrolytes checked a good four weeks after you're started on a diuretic because it could very well be that you might need to be on electrolyte supplementation like potassium or magnesium. And if you're not getting that, you can run the risk of having those muscle cramps and you don't want that. Somebody's got their thing on. If you're not talking, mute it until you get ready to talk, please. Thank you. I see a hand up. Ron, Ronald, is that you? Do you have a question? Another question? Or is that little? Um... That, that was me, Connie. Okay. 
Um, so I have a question. I was diagnosed with, um, with anxiety disorder. I was, um, about a year ago. Okay. So I've okay. actually gotten blood tests. They test it regularly because of my anxiety. Uh -huh. And I've noticed that I have not been, you know, nothing bad has come up about my blood pressure. Okay. So I, it's kind of a two part question. One, um, is there some sort of anomaly that could be going on? And two, should that be something that I'm watching regularly because I've gotten that diagnosis? I am on medications for it, okay. but um, I wanted to know, hey, is there something that, you know, I need to A, be watching? And two, is there something weird going on that I've never gotten like, hey, this is a red flag um, as far as my blood pressure? Well, anxiety can cause blood pressure, but what you have going for you is the fact that you are young. Okay. And your RE. <laughs> <laughs> you're welcome you're young and your your vessels are pliable so they oh are God. able to cushion and, and absorb some of that so your blood pressure is not high so kudos to you got but it okay yes, i would certainly be mindful and check it sporadically just to make sure it stays you know within normal limits and what pray tell me if you don't mind me asking i guess what i should say is as long as it's 120 or 80 or close to it you're fine yeah yeah it's it's around there it's it's always been around there um Perfect. I've never seen anything higher than that. Awesome. Um, than, than normal. Um, I've actually gotten a few that was a little too low and they had to retake and things like that just to make sure. Listen, um, if you're not I, lightheaded or dizzy, then it's not too low. Yeah, yeah. That was the thing. They said, we just wanted to double check, but no only because they knew the diagnosis because I, I was diagnosed with generalized uh, anxiety disorder. Okay. So because of the fact that it's such, you know, so many different things can set it off. Mm -hmm. It was one of the, uh, and they knew that, you know, I, I you know, you're talking about the alcohol thing. They knew that I was a drinker and things like that. They were like, hey, you know, numbers don't necessarily add up. So we just wanted to double check just to be safe. But, Sounds you know, I, I, again, it is something that, you know, I, I am curious about just because I know that the two go hand in hand as well as, you know, heart issues, things like that with anxiety. Right, right. It does. But as long as your blood pressure is good, it's good. Just make sure you keep drink. No drinking. Keep yeah, it down. I, I'll do the, I'll do the best I can to keep it down. Oh, good. I appreciate <laughs> that. I appreciate <laughs> that. <laughs> Miss Marie, you had a question. Mute yourself, my love. Yes. <laughs> I'm on the um, hydrochlorothiazide, and that's how you say it, the water pill. Hydrochlorothiazide, yes. Yeah, I'm on that. And I also have a blood pressure pill. They're separated. That years ago they used to be together, but now they're separated. I take the hydrochlorothiazide. You say it. And so call it HCTZ. That makes it easier. <laughs> okay. I take that in the morning. Okay. And I take the pressure pill at night. Is that's that fine. okay? That's fine. That gives you steady coverage, so that's good. You don't wake oh. up with a headache, right? No, I never really get headaches. No. Uh -uh. Yeah. Oh. But no, that's good. Twice a day is perfect. Okay. Yeah, I was worried about that. Nah, it's good. <laughs> now, you do check your blood pressure, right? Yeah, I check my pressure. Uh, yeah, it's, it's normal. Ever since I lost the weight, it's, it come, it been, it's usually below 120. And oh, the whole part is like I'm um, in the 70s. Perfect. Yeah. So I have no problem with that because of the weight loss. But, um, you know, you cheat and then things happen. But it's all right. <laughs> as long as you keep the weight steady and yeah. the lower weight, it's all good, you know. Okay. All right. Thank you. <laughs> Anyone else have any questions for D? All right. Okay, so just to recap, some of the key points that you mentioned basically is we want to ensure that we keep to the new standards of like 120 over 80 mm -hmm. um, really is what is considered high uh, healthy blood pressure. Mm -hmm. uh, we also want to make sure that if we happen to ha be 130 over 185 consistently or we want to start making some lifestyle modifications right. um, when we get to that point. Correct. Um, and when you were mentioning about our daily intake, we should definitely keep it within 2000 milligrams of sodium a day, mm -hmm. 500 per calorie, exercise at least three to four times a day. 
And we as African Americans, we when we're they're talking about medicine for us, we need to either talk about a diuretic or a calcium inhibitor. Diuretic calcium channel blocker. Well, inhibitor, that's fine. Yes. And it's 500 uh, milligrams per meal, 250. 250 milligrams between breakfast and lunch and 250 okay. milligrams snack between lunch and dinner so that you okay. get 2,000 milligrams of sodium a day. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, we want to thank you so much for coming on. and Thanks for uh, having me. Appreciate it. Um, I believe we're going to do a follow-up later on in the year again with you. Okay. We have a couple people that we're going to bring back health-wise and... Um, Again, we've we've had someone speak about COVID. We've had uh, about uh, diabetes. We've had you in here. Um, my, our goal and objective is to get this information out. Uh, you and I talked uh, last year about doing this and doing an actual seminar. And we're hoping that um, when this COVID thing has uh, flown the coop, that we can actually do a um, actual person-to-person -person type uh, seminar and hopefully uh, with some other activities involved with it. Um, I would definitely say that uh, the blood pressure cup, trying to get people to buy one of those uh, to have on hand, but but to properly use it as well. Um, I know some people have it, but they can't use it or don't know what they're doing uh, with it. So there's a lot of great things uh, that you said to us and this will be on our Facebook page and our YouTube channel as well. And hopefully it will touch uh, hundreds of people um, and people can continuously go back on it. So again, we thank you so much uh, for being on it. We thank Connie again for as a moderator and each and every one of you that uh, tuned in tonight to be here as part of this. And so we'll be looking to have you back again soon. Thank and uh, hopefully we can get some more people to tune in and be part of uh, our program that we continue to do um, uh, through the church, touching and investing in ourselves and investing in God. Connie? But before you leave, Dee, there was one other question I forgot about. And that was about the cup size and the replacement. Because when you purchase, you normally just buy them. You're right. It comes with one cup size. Right. Does Do you have to have one specific for your machine? Or can you just buy any cuff that should fit the machine? You can buy the, if you need to, you fit the larger cup that fits the machine. Mm, but okay. most of them are the same in terms right. of they all have this little piece here. And it fits in this little hole. Mm -hmm. So it should fit. Okay. Okay. If you if you go to your pharmacist, yes. they'll tell you they may have to order the larger cup. Because when I got mine, they had to order me a larger cup. Did so they? They'll order it. Uh, you just have to let them know. And uh, they're, they're pretty good about that kind of stuff. And to make sure the one they order you fits the machine you have. Right, and Walgreens has the larger cuffs okay. as well. Okay, because I ordered one from Amazon and my cup is a little tight. All right, well, All thank right. you, everybody. Thank Have you, a good everyone. Um, you take care. We will come back with in the next couple of weeks in um, April with a new series. We will be announcing that soon, what we our topic will be shortly. Um, we may stay on health. We may switch to insurance, but wow. <laughs> depending on where we're going, please stay tuned and watch our Facebook page for the announcement of what our next session will be for April. Thank you, everyone. Take Bye -bye. care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Good night. Bye -bye. Good night.